Okay, welcome everybody. I'm surprised about the interest that we have here for this presentation. Uh, I guess not everybody from you is engineer, is this correct? Yes. 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 Okay, so before we start um, about the evolution of telecom power, I think I should give you a very short introduction about power, otherwise uh, non-engineers wouldn't understand anything at all. So when we talk about voltage, power, AC, DC, everybody heard that, not only with health bells, but if we talk about uh, power, we have a polarity of a signal, which is we have a plus or minus voltage, and our products produce a DC voltage, which means if we go over time, there is more or less no change of the output voltage during the time. This is the product that we need to feed our telecom loads and uh, the output of our rectifiers. The input is a kind of sinusoidal AC signal and uh, that's more or less our business to convert the AC to a, a suitable DC for our customers inside of a rectifier. And uh, we have more or less a symbol for rectifier where we have on the input side the AC and on the output side the DC. And also important when we talk about the efficiency, efficiency means the relation between the input power to the output power and the losses of the conversion. If I take 100% of input power, we will have here the conversion stage which produces some losses. I take a bad one, 10% losses like heat. So this means at the output we will have 90% of power that we can use. So when we talk about a high efficiency rectifier, everybody knows this high efficiency rectifier, we have an efficiency of 95%, which is equivalent that we have losses of 5% here and 95% of output power there. This is important when we talk about this development later on. And uh, another important thing in the evolution is the power density. Power density means how much volume do I need to convert a power like this. So if we take a liter, which might be of a size like that, today we have something with a flat pack S like almost three kilowatts per liter and it was completely different in former times. But when we talk later on about power density, it's the size that I need to convert such power. I think that's enough about physics and then I can start with the presentation. Um, first of all, we'll talk about the different converter types that are available for telecom power. After that, uh, I'll discuss with you the evolution. Evolution means beginning in the last decades of the 19th century when telecom or telephones were invented. We'll have a summary later on about the main drivers of the evolution. And finally, I'll also tell you something about what we think is the nearer future for telecom power. We'll see there are a lot of different converter types today. The rectifier we already had converts the AC from the mains to a suitable DC. The inverter is more or less uh, vice versa of it, makes an AC out of the DC power. UPSs have an AC input, a DC intermediate circuit and AC output again. DC-DC converters are used if we want to change the level of the regulated DC power. Diesel transets is a kind of generator that transforms the energy out from the diesel, from the fuel, into an AC voltage with a generator set. Then we have this uh, renewable power converters like the solar, which is taking the unregulated power from these uh, solar panels to regulate regulated telecom power. Wind is something more complex, as Lars Elström <laughs> can tell you. But at the end, 
uh, it has also to produce uh, regulated DC output power fuel cells, convert the energy which is stored in hydrogen into a regulated DC power. And if we have a combination out of some of these things, we talk about hybrid systems. We could talk about ours for all of these different kinds of converters and our main products are rectifiers, so today we just concentrate on rectifier technology. So the evolution of telecom power began <coughs> from my point of view around 1876 when Abraham Graham Bell patented the telephone. Telephone, by the way, means distance voice. The first public telephone network in Germany was founded in 1881 in Berlin. And the feeding of these telephones happened with primary cell batteries. So uh, they were using the chemical process from zinc carbon, for instance, and they were not rechargeable. So this means once this battery was discharged, they had to put a new battery in. And uh, such a, what's going on here? Uh, such a telephone had uh, also a crank handle to generate an AC signal for the ringtone. And uh, you can easily imagine that this way of feeding a network doesn't give you power to feed hundreds, thousands or more. So with decreasing number of interested people in telephone, they also had to consider how to feed DC into the network. So this was one of the first high power solutions that we have on the market. This is a combination of an AC motor, which we see here, and DC dynamo, which has a DC output. And this was a typical way, and here we can see from the power data of this thing, we had a 3.3 .3 kilowatt electrical input here, and could get out about 2.2 kilowatts at the typical telecom voltage of 68 volt, but with 2.2 kilowatts, which means under best conditions, we had a kind of efficiency of 60%. And this technology was also suitable to feed up large networks. <laughs> Looks funny for engineers like us today, and impressive, but very nice. And it uh, was taken for many decades, this kind of technology. When we come to the 20s to the 50s, we had uh, the age of the mercury arc rectifier started. And what else was important, that the manual exchange switches, which means all the ladies that you could see in this small movie before, which were switching on these panels, were replaced by automatic switches. And uh, during the 30s, you see manual switches disappeared, automatic exchanges came up. And with that, also the number of uh, customers increased rapidly, and with rapidly increasing numbers of phones, also increasing number uh, of demand for power. So the evolution of telecom brought a kind of monster, it looks like a prehistoric monster, which is the Mercury Arc rectifier. And this was a dominant uh, rectifier also for many decades, the principle, more or less, was uh, there is a mercury lake as a can uh, cathode in the bottom of this vessel. Then we have the anodes distributed around. There's an ignition anode and some auxiliary anodes which help to start a spark. A spark coming more or less here from this uh, cathode to the anode. And the effect is that the electrons only had one direction, which we call a rectifier. And uh, here you see such a mercury arc rectifier in action. So this is a cathode with the uh, mercury and the anodes. But this is a slow motion movie because this is uh, with a frequency of 50 hertz. 
but maybe some of you like Flash Gordon movies out from the 30s of the last century, maybe. There you saw this kind of things in the background, like this future blooming things, yeah? Anyways, in 1930, the telecom network in Europe was already very well developed and growing all over Europe. So what we can see here is a long distance telephone network in Europe where we have here Central Europe, UK, also this region here was already well developed in 1930. And we had already more than 3 million people in Germany connected to the phone. Already a nice number. But then there came a hard drawback. It was the Second World War. So uh, engineers and people who are skilled were busy with fighting for their lives or for survival, but not with telecom power. And in addition, there was also destruction of the infrastructure through bombs and so on. So you can see here the Frankfurt Central Office after a bomb attack in 1943. Uh, and it's easy to see that there was no more infrastructure available to telephone. So more or less this development stuck during this time. Thanks God, this war ended and in the 50s there started a new era of rectifier technology. It's what we call the magnetic regulated or ferro-resonant effect. It's a type of rectifier where we have on the input side a so-called ferro-resonator which was regulated with a low control power and at the out secondary side there is a diode bridge. In the first time it was taken with selenium diodes but selenium diodes had a bad characteristic. They had a bad efficiency. Bad efficiency <coughs> means a lot of heat losses and therefore they needed a lot of space for heat sinks to get rid and to get cooling to these uh, diodes. A couple of years later, um, the victory of silicium started, and then in the same topology of uh, magnetic regulated rectifiers, silicium diodes came in, and this improved the efficiency a lot, because the silicium diodes had much less losses, and we can see some typical diodes from this time, still big, but much more efficient than the selenium. In the 1970s, the evolution came up with a new technology, what we call Saristo rectifiers. Also in this time, the first public mobile network started. This is a telephone from the C network. Not really good to carry in the pocket, but at least to carry in the car. And uh, huge rectifiers could be designed with this kind of technology. If we see a typical input part, input section of such a saristor rectifier, a saristor is like, we can say like a diode which has a control signal which could be started or stopped on command. And this allowed a regulation with a so-called B6 bridge, what we have here, with the effect that uh, using, when we come to the rectified AC signal with the help of the ignition pulse, they were using more or less of this uh, power under this curve. This gave the first active regulation in this kind of rectifiers. And uh, this allowed the design of systems like this one. It's a 20,000 amps side in Munich, where we have 10,000 amps installed on the one side, and it's a back-to-back -back configuration where we have exactly the same number of cabinets on the rear side of this thing. Big power, big copper, so these are the battery strings for such a 20,000 amps side, which end up in a battery room with a 96,000 ampere hours 60 volt battery. I think this is something really imp impressive. 
And just to have an image of the size, this guy here behind, that's me, so the room is even larger than this room filled up completely with batteries. Then in the 1990s, the victory of the switch mode power began. First with uh, what I say is the first generation of switch mode rectifiers, which is a kind of hard switched rectifier. As we can see here, an example for three phase. So we have here the input with a B6 dial bridge input filter bulk capacitors. Then here this is the switched bridge with a high frequency switch, pulse width modulation, high frequency transformer, which, convert, uh, which transfers the energy from the primary side to the secondary side and simultaneously also makes the separation between the input and the output voltage level. Then the pulse signal had to be rectified again on the secondary side and the output filter and the regulation takes care of the quality of the signal. Pulse width modula uh, modulation was typical. These were hardwired uh, control devices and uh, equivalent to the length of the pulses here on this bridge, we had the output power available. Unfortunately, this technology made a lot of noise, especially uh, electrical noise, which disturbed all kind of trans uh, transmission equipment, tele uh, television, and so on. And uh, so, a lot of standards were uh, published to improve the environment according to all this upcoming switch mode power that generated a lot of disturbances. Also during this time, there was a decreasing power demand due to a restructuring of the telecom switch equipment. It went from the old, more or less analog technology, which was very power consuming, to digital switches, which had much less power demand per customer. And also uh, the GSM network started to operate. So this meant that these huge rectifiers that we saw before were more or less out of date or there was at least a huge demand now for smaller switch mode power modules. Simultaneously, we also had a price erosion on the market. I think uh, at least the other ones from us know that. And the result was that uh, most European companies transferred their production to low salary countries like China. This also had an impact on the design of rectifiers because then you needed something which is easy to handle, easy to transfer, whereby easy is something in brackets. But you didn't have any more so many specialists sitting downstairs changing things and so on. You had to be prepared for a high volume production with high quality. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, at the same time, uh, the controller development made big progresses. The progress came more, oops, this was too fast, sorry. The progress came from the introduction of microprocessors in the technology. Before that time, we had some kind of hard wired control units, which were more or less with fixed uh, programs. But now at the time of Ole Morton and his friends came, that uh, you could make programs software and no more this hard wiring of the functionality. Also, LCD displays came up. The first were rather poor dot matrix displays, but anyways, better than just LEDs or lamps before. And also, uh, control buses came up and remote monitoring um, was set into the world, but the most telecom operators used something proprietary. Proprietary means something that they invented their themselves and specified themselves because there was a lack of standardization for such kind of remote monitoring telegrams. At the end of the 90s, the uh, telecom industries found out that it is very expensive and uh, tried first attempts to make standardization also on top level uh, between more than 
uh, or at least 10 companies. I think Altec was also one of the companies that uh, joined this uh, attempt. Anyways, beginning in 2000, we talk about switch mode rectifiers of the second generation, which have soft switching, uh, resonance technology, as we are using here in LTEC today, for instance. The age of the digital signal processor began. This means that uh, also it was possible to take regulation functions into software, no more uh, uh, just in hardwired PWM controllers or something like that. And not much later, uh, we had this high efficiency, uh, which came up. LTEC was the inventor of high efficiency technology. We are very proud of that still today. Especially you guys can be, where's Eric and so on. <laughs> Hybrid systems are now also on the market and uh, a very Im big uh, impact on telecom power is also given with this uh, high data volumes which is given with VDSL, with LTE and so on requiring smaller cells and also smaller power, but high volumes and uh, temperature ranges and so on. So we can see that the telecom power ranges today from, I would say, a few hundred watts in a DSLAM. This is a typical German DSLAM where they distribute telephone and uh, internet services to the last mile. And uh, mobile base stations with a power demand of a few kilowatts, depending on how much technology they put in, but usually it's less than five kilowatts at least. And uh, for the data centers or high power applications, we still have something like 20,000 amp sites for the backbone for the internet, for instance. This is a site in Frankfurt. And uh, what we can see here that the old Sarista technology, which was installed in the same location, was replaced a few years ago against high efficiency power, which has a lower space demand and, of course, the benefit of much less energy cost. And this is also something typical for the ongoing years, that old, inefficient technology will be replaced by high efficiency. Okay. On the control unit side, during the last decade, we had uh, the effects of more modular structures, like we know from our CAN nodes and things like that. Uh, powerful configuration tools with local and remote access, like web power, like power suite, things like that. This came up during this time. Also, the standardization from this remote monitoring made a big progress. In the meanwhile, SNMP and SNMP version 3, which is the most modern thing that we have, and which is also more or less now coming up as standard on the market. Uh, we have very nice displays. Look to the Smart Pack 2 compared with what we had before. This is now very nice resolution and uh, probably still improving. And uh, also smart energy, smart, meet, uh, smart, yeah, smart grid and hybrid technology is integrated completely, which was not possible before when the memory size of the controllers were, was not enough to introduce such things earlier. Well, we spoke about these hybrid sites, which is nowadays also a good market, especially where we have PV, solar technology, feeding on the telecom bus in parallel with gensets. Uh, wind is possible and also, of course, rectifiers. By the way, a configuration like we see it here, this is a maximum configuration and I never saw a site which can in integrate all of that simultaneously. So this is just a, a model. In reality, the most systems that we probably sell at this is kind of PV genset combination, especially in countries like here close to deserts or something where the main infrastructure is very poor. Now we can make a summary of the main drivers for the telecom power evolution. 
We spoke about efficiency. You remember the effect here. So that's, that's the development of the efficiency through the, about the last hundred years, coming from this AC engine, DC dynamo. And by the way, the highest grade or, uh, was here in the between 40s and 60s when they started with this kind of silicon rectifier instead of uh, previous technology. And then with Sarista technology, switch mode power, now we are somewhere here. On the market 96 to some competitors announced 98. We also saw something like 90, 70, uh, 97, 98% in the lab, but not uh, really on the market. But we all have to consider that this line of 100% is the absolute limit. If, if, if there's somebody who has more, please tell me and uh, <laughs> I share the patent. <laughs> Anyways, so, but what does that mean? This means that, of course, there is not much more potential to achieve, even if, if you spend a lot of money in that, uh, there's something where you are on the physical limits. Yeah? We have to consider that in all our uh, development and market uh, announcements. Much more interesting is the development of the power density, and there I'm not sure where the end is. But if you remember all the monsters that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation, which had three, about three kilowatts, and now see our flat pack S with 1.8 kilowatts. So the power density more or less was the same as long as we were linked to the 50 hertz main frequency transformers and so on, everything on this kind of 50 hertz. But with increasing frequency, we have now a completely different characteristic where we can transfer power through the module. And I'm really excited of where it finally ends. And what does this mean in reality? I tried to put it all in the same scale. <laughs> so the engine version, the monster, Mercury Arc, a switch mode rectifier of the first generation, about 95, and a flat pack to 3 kilowatts. And that's impressive, and this gives us, of course, a lot of different possibilities to design systems of applications where to put in the rectifiers, and so on. On the control units, if we see something from the 1950s, a lot of meters, also very nice, a real clock, a real-time system, <laughs> switches, and, and, and so on. So this was something, I would say, typical uh, around 95, 2000, uh, a kind of tiny dot matrix LCD display, some LEDs, some buttons. At this time, this was more or less hip. Today, they, we would say, oh, crazy. Never, and a uh, typical interface was the RS-232 to the computer. And today we have something very nice, our smart pack too. What is obvious is the much nicer display, uh, also with this uh, task-oriented menu structure and so on, which is now possible <coughs> with uh, much more memory space and whatever is given more performance in this control unit. You can have a very fine graphic. You have kind of touchpad functionality, or as, at least instead of these <coughs> buttons and so on. So this is typical for today. And the configuration tools, for about 100 years, the configuration tool number one was the screwdriver. Uh, so with potentiometers, switches, analog meters, and so on, all these things were necessary to set up a system. About 10 years ago, it changed to, on the one hand, the already uh, explained uh, display unit on the, on the uh, controller and uh, kind of special software which usually had to be installed on the computer gave us the possibility for a nice configuration, but the big disadvantage for the customers was every supplier brought 
its own software like that. And uh, the customers hated that software from company A, company B, company C, and everything different, and maybe conflicts on the computer. They really, on the one hand, liked the functionality, but they hated the conflicts on their computer. But during this time, it was still impossible to integrate such a software on this unit because the memory size was just too small. So we had to put this intelligence on the computer. Nowadays, of course, we also have a, a power suite, but with web power, we are now able also to make all this configuration uh, more or less with a standard web browser. So then the intelligence of this software is more or less in the memory of the control unit. And this was a large step because now the customers can use more or less the same software on the high end to adjust, to read, and whatever with the sites. And it also allows much more functionality than before. Web interfaces are not so old. I remember the first web interfaces around 2000 when they appeared on the market, more or less um, uh, units which were separate from the controller. So it was boxes which were able to contain and to have the performance for um, web signalization, web protocols and so on, because these tiny controllers were not able to communicate in such networks like Ethernet, Internet and so on. So you had to put another hardware on it. In the meanwhile, we can integrate all this functionality into a Smart Pack 2, but unfortunately we are not the only ones who can do it, it's also the competition that can do it due to the memory size, due to the performance, to clock speed, and whatever is given now with the modern control units. So it's a kind of mandatory to have it. Remote monitoring is maybe older than we think. So in 1950, there was a nice company, company in Frankfurt who had a kind of remote monitoring center. Uh, the distance to the remote sites was, of course, limited because it was analog signals and so on. But anyways, it was possible to have a central control uh, location in Frankfurt for the environment or the area of Frankfurt. Then in the 90s, modem solutions came up with <laughs> some thousand baud, which is <laughs> unbelievable if we think about megabaud today, factor many thousands. But anyways, this was a nice start. And there was already a kind of uh, sophisticated signaling, but uh, due to this timing and so on, it was uh, a limited network. But it worked, and somehow it began. In the meanwhile, I think everybody knows this very nice tool, where we can have, on the one hand, alarming, we can also monitor and uh, make statistics and so on. So this multi-site monitoring software is a very powerful tool to help the customer to reduce maintenance, service costs, the network management, also to see where are weaknesses, uh, which sites, sites are maybe overdimensioned, which are exactly the opposite. So this is an important step. I hope also many more customers understand that in the near future, that this is not only invest cost, it also helps to optimize the network. So the main drivers for the evolution in general are of course CAPEX and OPEX reduction. CAPEX is invest cost when you buy new equipment. OPEX is the operational expenses like of course energy, like maintenance, service cost, and everything around which happens all day. And TCO is the abbreviation for total cost of ownership, which at the end is the summary of this. Availability and performance of the components on the market is a very important thing because if you don't have the right components, you can't design new products and we only can use the components which we can buy. And uh, with improving components, we also could improve our rectifiers, but also vice versa, with better rectifiers, it's a kind of chain. Increasing flexibility is very important 
Charles Darwin said, and I think he was right, it's not the strongest who survives, it's maybe not the most intelligent who survives, it's the one who has the best flexibility to adapt to the situation which is given. Environmental conditions are drivers. 50 years ago, nobody thought about outdoor systems. Today we have outdoor systems, even down to this uh, micro cells, where we have very small power units which are exposed to sun, snow, and whatever. Standards and regulations had a big impact, especially the EMC directive about 15 years ago was very important from the impact on the design of rectifiers. We had efficiency in power density. I don't think to s I need to stress that more. We saw that in an impressive example. Service and maintenance is also very important. Our customers usually tend to a direction that they want to have kind of, excuse me, but they want to have kind of monkeys for servicing. They see a red light and then they put out, pull out the module, push in a new module. So 20 years ago, the guys out in the field had a very good competence. If nowadays you come to the sites, uh, sometimes you're very disappointed what you see. Anyway, so the last few minutes, we will talk a little bit about the future. We are thinking about improving efficiency. That's what everybody in the field says. And uh, I already saw something here in R&D with better efficiency. The question is when and how much is the customer prepared to pay more money to even more efficiency? Or is it better just to stay on a level and improve cost picture? High voltage data center, high voltage DC is a <laughs> strange word because for many people high voltage begins somewhere with 100,000 volt but for this data center they more or less agreed to consider 400 volt as high voltage. Anyways, we are working on such solutions today here in LTEC. Uh, this is a running word for many years but in the meanwhile we see that also very important server suppliers like HP design products which accept 400 volt DC. So this seems to be uh, also indicator that the market is getting to this direction. <coughs> Smart system design for further OPEX reductions. This is especially also in outdoor applications where uh, energy cost is an issue. Hybrid solutions also for energy and CO2 savings. On the control side, we think uh, or we are already working on smart grid solutions, energy management functions, everything around that, so that the telecom sites are not just used poor, uh, just for telecom applications. We also uh, talk about primary frequency market and things like that, as we have here our specialist OJ Soderheim. And in uh, Germany, you already have some projects running with Deutsche Telekom. Well, this nice picture shows maybe a kind of future where we have a central brain. This could be a product from us or also from a utility or whatever, a control computer which receives all the data from the private households, from e-mobility, from renewable power, DC building is in this case a, a, a telecom building, utility power, and uh, it's interesting business model to provide this smart grid functionality control for all these different energy sources and energy consumers. Well, so far my presentation about the evolution of telecom power. Thank you for your interest.